Officer, we'll jump right into the thick of things with the battle. You joined the Navy following college and graduated from initial pilot training as World War II neared. In August 1943, you shipped out on the USS Independence and had your first action strafing Japanese ships. Tell us about your first victory over Wake Island against the Zero. It was the first time that the Hellcat had gone up against the Vaughn Japanese fighter. They always say that the first one is the one you remember the most, and I believe in this case probably so. Uh, I was... Uh, oh. <laughs> okay, you didn't miss that one. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm stopping the bleeding. I just hit something in the back there on there. But anyway, I was wingman to Butch O'Hare at the time, and it was my first, we had had combat a little before that at Marcus, but there was no air action. In this particular case, was the first time I've actually, actually saw a Japanese plane in the air. But we were hitting Wake on October 5th of uh, 43, and my radio wasn't working that particular day. However, Butch had us pretty well trained, having been his um, wingman and then worked into his section lead. But uh, he, he kind of gave us a chance to know what our role was, even if things happened uh, not according to Hoyle. But anyhow, uh, we spotted, uh, we were under control of a cruiser division that had the, the fighter direction uh, capability. And I could tell the way Butch was handling the signals and all that something was happening. And I spotted a group of three zeros heading for Wake Island. And the three of us, or the four of us, actually made a run on them. And uh, my role as section lead was to take the inside turn on it and went on down. And Butch took the outside plane. And the lead plane was heading to land down at uh, Wake Island. Well, my. Uh, action at the, that time was get in there and the first time you see an enemy plane you, you want to get, shoot it down but at the same time it feels so good to go you practically fly through it and I think I did but uh, it blew them up pretty well and pulled on up and Butch, Butch's plane took his section down under the cloud cover but I had my eye on the, on the zero that was leading the formation and it went over and landed at Wake and he kind of staggered off, he landed and then shuttled off to the side of the, of the runway. And, but anyway, I figured I signaled Willie, my, my uh, uh, wingman, and so we went down to strafe. And so I burnt the zero on the ground also, and then I was zigzagging across the field. There was a Betty parked out there. So I made another run, and we came down and burnt that one too. Well, anyway, that was the action, but it, it happened so fast, you, know, you just don't know what, what else uh, to, to say about something like that. It has to, has to occur sooner or later. But anyway, that was the first. You made it back to Pearl Harbor on another carrier after your USS Independence was torpedoed, and then you transferred to USS Intrepid. You soon shipped out to truck the Gibraltar of the Pacific. Can you sh share your experience on this very ex intense battle? Normally, on carriers, you escort a lot. You fly a lot of uh, uh, hops where you're escorting the bombers and the torpedo planes, so you don't get a chance to have all air action, just fighter action. But they had a fighter sweep scheduled, uh, when was it, February 14th, I think it was, of uh, 44. And my, uh, I was, uh, I might say we, we did some training, we changed our position. Butch was, had already been uh, in a strange night mission, was already uh, killed because he was over on another ship at the time, moved over as air group commander, and so we were under a different uh, setup at the time uh, in a leadership deal. But anyway, we had trained after Butch was killed, we had trained at the night fighter deal. They were, uh, it was an innovation on how to handle uh, a night fighting off of carriers, and believe me, it was it was very primitive. It was a case where you'd have a torpedo plane and two fighters on the wing, and then you're flying about a thousand feet. You launch about dusk, and then the torpedo plane had a radar, which we didn't have in the fighters at that time, and you uh, are vectored ahead. And when you see a, an exhaust, that's the enemy plane. You shoot. Well, this particular uh, uh, training that we had. Um, uh, 
uh, kind of set the course for us to train for a couple months over at Maui. And then when we uh, finished that, well, then we got aboard the Intrepid, the whole air group for the first time together uh, on, the, on the Intrepid. And the truck raid happened to be one that uh, came, and the first mission, actually, the truck was, uh, they, uh, how was it that made the comment? Admiral Mitchell, I believe, made the comment, the only thing they knew about truck is what they read in uh, National Geographic. It was that potent a place, so they weren't too sure of what to expect. But anyway, uh, our division, which was the two teams of, uh, for the night fighter deal for that time, uh, was at the tail end of a 12-plane deal off of our ship, and it was a total of uh, 72 planes that went in. And our job was to come in real early in the morning, uh, down low, and then climb on up to about 10, 12,000 feet before we hit, hit Truck Atoll. One of the lithographs in the hallway covers that particular event. I just thought about that. But anyway, the... Uh, uh, we were all set to, uh, nothing seemed to be in the air at the time, and then all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. And our particular division, or a uh, group of 12 planes, was vectored to head on down. And um, my wingman and I, Lou Little and I, were the last two planes in that group of 12, and they had picked some planes down below to strafe. And that's actually... Uh, um, it was just a case of getting ready to pick something on the ground, and I always remember something that old Butch O'Hare had always told me, look back over his shoulder before you head down for a strafing run, which I did. Sure enough, there were some zeros coming down on us. You can see the blinking of their guns already. So I did what you had to do, and that is turn into them right away. And then we just had the wildest air action you could have imagined. The turkey shoot was, was tame compared to this. But anyway, we worked them down to our level, and it just seemed like things just worked our way, and there were so many of our planes up in the air, once in a while uh, you'd get somebody to help you at the same time to use what you called a thatch weave. But uh, we got ourselves, and uh, I worked, I got three of them, and then there was one more playing, and I had to play cat and mouse with him. He was duck, ducking in and out of the clouds. And so I went upwind, and then came down out of the sun on him, and I don't think he ever knew what hit him on there. But anyway, that was the, uh, it, was, it was wild because of the air action. But anyway, we got back to the ship, and then that night we got torpedoed, and I had the pleasure of being knocked out of my sack at about two o'clock in the morning. But I always blame our night, one of our night fighters that had radar for not catching up with that Kate torpedo plane before he got our carrier. But anyway, we had to, the ship uh, was hit and its uh, rudder was out of line. And they had to rig a sail, if you can imagine, rigging a sail up on a forecastle to help navigate that carrier back to Pearl Harbor, where we always ended up at that time. So you returned back to Pearl Harbor, and your squadron was turned stateside, but you asked to stay out. Stay out. So you shipped out with VF-16 in the USS Lexington, sailing for the Marianas in 1944. On 19 June, the Japanese threw everything they had against your fleet to protect the Marianas, because they knew that the Marianas would give the U.S. strategic bombing bases against Japan. Can you share with this class your view of the battle and how you downed six aircraft in eight minutes with only 306 rounds of ammunition? 360. 360, thank you. <laughs> I think I got it right in my paper. <laughs> One of the uh, operations officers, we, had this, we were on a Lexington at the time. I had uh, uh, joined the squad a little bit earlier, and uh, the operation officers for Admiral Mitchell, who, who had it as a flagship, made a bet to our squadron that we would have a fleet engagement in seven days. Well, everybody said, ha, ha. And the Japanese fleet had not come out to fight ever since uh, Midway. And we had built up mightily up until that time, and we were really very strong in our capability. We, I don't know, we had a good 15 carriers, attack carriers, a lot of alternates. We even had a few Jeep carriers there that had uh, Air Force planes to be put ashore at Saipan. I mean, it was, it was a tremendous buildup. The Japanese came out with nine, nine carriers, 
and the submarines took on a couple of them on a way out, uh, on a way from Japan, and we were getting intelligence information um, all along, and, but they suddenly lost track of them. Now they were coming, heading into the wind, which meant they could launch and take off heading in the same direction, whereas where our group, our 15, we had four different task groups spread out in a row to try to keep them from coming over to hit Saipan. The main job for this landing um, was to, which we didn't know, you had to stop and realize that a lot of us were merely lowly junior grades, uh, lieutenant junior grades, and we learned a lot about this afterwards, so if I sound too knowledgeable, it's because I read a lot of stuff too afterwards. But anyway, the um, landings uh, had started, and uh, Saipan was the one, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of them on there, where uh, it was kind of vicious and they were, people were jumping off the cliff and all that. But then uh, Tinian and Guam were part of it too. And I think if you've seen war stories, they covered this particular landing series. And, uh, but the um, Tinian one, which we didn't know along with 99.9% .9 of the people, was where the B-29s were to launch from to drop the first atomic bomb. So it became a lot more important. And having strafed there a little ahead of time along with a lot of the others made you gulp a little bit when you realized afterwards what had occurred. But anyway, the, the $1,000 bet was on and uh, the Japanese uh, this turned out to be the greatest fleet air engagement of all time and ever will be because we don't fight that way anymore. Um, we, we shot down more planes. I mean, it depends which historian you want to believe. I mean, some of them go up to 402, others are into the 300s. And the Marianas turkey shoot came about because they would launch a good 400 plus planes towards us and then we we ended up having four separate raids and our our job on a Lexington I was part of a 12 plane I had by that time I'd moved up to division lead and the planes were spotted on a deck wings already spread ready to go and we were on standby waiting till they could catch some incoming planes on a radar screen well sure enough eventually it came and it was about mid-morning or somewhere about 10 20 in the, in the morning when the word came in and we were told to launch climb up gate full speed uh, up to 25,000 feet well we took off and Skippers have a chance to pick a better airplane than the rest of us, or at least have a later engine, and the skipper happened to have one on that particular hop. And carrier planes catch hell. There's a lot, of, a lot of effort on them, and as you well know, sometimes they beef them up the wheels and all that, but they do catch hell, and they have to uh, be replaced quite frequently. But uh, Skipper had a, um, a more powerful engine at the time, and we start off, we were supposed to rendezvous en route, climbing up full power and the wingman's engine or the prop froze his engine he just couldn't keep up his engine and he had to ditch in the water and they picked him up but you know 12 14 hours later um, I uh, I started to I got up to 20,000 feet and I was trying to go into high blower uh, to make the additional difference, but my, my engine wouldn't, couldn't take it. I couldn't go into high blower, so 20,000 became my limit. So I made a call back to the fighter director, your radio silence, as much as you can, of course, but I called back and mentioned, and he asked me to bring back my group and circle on the outer screen and await an additional um, assignment. Well, I barely get back to the, to the, uh, to the outer screen when I get a vector, and just the sound of his voice sounded so good, you know, you can tell something was good was coming on. And so I'm heading out at that altitude uh, with my group and a couple more planes tacked on, and there were others heading from that direction over there too. And uh, finally we get to a, a certain point, and I use a, what they call a, a um, uh, I, I, I range my, my eyesight as spot gazing, and I spotted three dots, and I said, no, it's got to be more than three from the sound of his voice. 
And so I looked some more, and sure enough, very shortly, coming in an opposite direction, we're about 50 or 60 in this batch of planes, a motley group, no formation, you know, heavy formation, just a loose deal. And we were, they're coming opposite direction, 2,000 feet below, perfect high side run. And so my eyeballs got pretty big on the time, and I said, once in a lifetime, nobody's going to have something like that often. And so I get in there, I waggle my wing. Why do we waggle our wings all the time <laughs> before we make a run? But I remember doing that, and I'm heading on down, and uh, I picked a plane on the outer screen. Now, some, if this was a formation, a big formation, some people would go for the head plane to try to break up the attack. But these guys were spattered all over. But uh, I pick a plane on the outer edge of the screen. I start on down. And I'm just about ready to fire. When out of my, my peripheral vision, I see another plane having designs on the same airplanes same airplane and so I thought to myself well there are enough cookies on this plane for all of us a plate so for all of us so I'll just pick on another one and so I, I pulled underneath it and I kind of uh, figured out what, what it was and I made a report on the type of planes reported that in then pulled up from the other side and then started my run uh, on these and I came on down on the first one and uh, uh, I don't. I had oil on my. I, I forgot to tell you this. As I was climbing up, I had oil on my windshield, and uh, uh, and I had to pull back my throttle a little bit. But when um, um, I got in for actual fire range, I had to get in closer. I normally go, would go in. I was taught also to get in close, conserve ammunition, fuel, all these little goodies that later come to help you out and sometimes save your life. But anyway, I'm, um, I, I burnt the first one and then pulled on up and started to run back on the other. There's a lithograph out here that was done by also on, uh, on that same subject. But anyway, the second one, I came in on and uh, uh, I bur got him burning, dipped a wing and slid over and got one that was just slightly to the side of him and got him burning. And I noticed that as they were going down, you know, black smoke trailing into a kind of a death spiral, that there was this gunner on the tail end or the, and the rear seat of this Judy for those of you that don't know, the code systems, the bombers were named after ladies, uh, like Judy's, Fran, or Jill, whatever. And uh, the, the fighters had male names on a thing, but these happened to be Judy's. And, uh, but anyway, he was still firing away at me and peppering away with that 7.7 .7 on a thing. And, you know, uh, I got laughed at for saying this, but, you know, for a split second, I almost felt sorry for the little bastard, really. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, not for long. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway I pulled back up and uh, uh, just continued. Then I saw a string of some others in the thing, and you could see that some of the planes were starting to lower uh, in their altitude. Uh, and you could see that the, the uh, uh, torpedo planes were heading on down too. And it was just a case of having to work fast. And uh, I'll admit, I got in closer than I normally would, but you know, we joke a lot about it and say, whenever in doubt, fill up your windshield and then you're safe to fire. But uh, uh, in this particular case, it was, it was a, a, a kind of a tail chase with a mild deflection shot, and that's about it. But anyway, I burnt one more, and every single one of them seemed to burn and get hit in a different way. And then there was a string of three of them, and the first one was already starting to go down to make a dive, and, the, and another one was just preparing to do it, and I caught up with the rear one and got him, and I, I know I made a report at the time, there, there uh, an awful lot of them, I don't see how we can get them all, but uh, anyway, I, I worked my way up and uh, I blew one up. I must have hit his bomb. The Judy's had bombs internally. But anyway, I must have hit the bomb because he blew up like nothing I've seen before. And I was, I could see the outer screen uh, 
uh, uh, shots were coming on up, and we could see that the action was pretty strong, uh, starting to come up from below. But I, uh, I didn't have to worry about going after that last one because a battleship or somebody blew him up out of the sky. All of a sudden, I looked back. I looked uh, back, and all you could see were Hellcats in the air. That was our predominant fighter at the time, uh, almost 100%. Uh, and, um, and there was a trail of uh, uh, oil slicks in the water, pieces flying in the air, you know, still left over that last 35 miles or so that we came. And I suddenly felt good. I said, boy, this is my payback for Pearl Harbor, and that's how I felt. But uh, I head back to rendezvous were to go back to approach the carrier and I came from the 120 degrees, made two turns to the right. All of a sudden our five inch shells from our fleet and not so friendly fire were firing at me and I'd like to think that what I said on the radio was what stopped them, but I know better than that. I mean they finally caught up with these guys and passing on the word and so I came on in I landed, and um, I reached down to unfasten, to unlock my my wing lock, uh, and the red barrels on the wing. Uh, and all of a sudden, I realized I had flown the whole hop with the red barrel still sticking up in the wing. So I didn't have fully locked wings. Now, my wingman, I forgot to tell you that while we were climbing up. He kept pointing down at a wing, at his wing, and I thought he spotted the enemy. And after he did it the third time, we'll talk about it later. Type of an, <laughs> of an action. But anyway, I gulped a few times, realizing all the time I thought I'd live dangerously for a few moments there in the air. But like I said, it seemed they told me they told me that it was eight eight uh, minutes all it took on there. And uh, but and the. I might explain the 360 rounds. We have six, uh, six uh, 50 caliber. Fighter pilots can't talk without hands, believe me. But with a six uh, 50 caliber, the total rounds of 2,400. But that meant that, and they're bore sighted out about 300 uh, yards or so. But when you're in close, you don't have to worry about uh, being close because any one of the two or three streams will get the get the uh, the plane. But um, I, I, I just uh, uh, figured out, they told me there was 10 rounds per gun per enemy plane. So I have to live with that. Thank you. After some time off, he got about 30 days of time off. He went home and he met his wife uh, and he got married two and a half weeks later. But he only two had the. And, and he came back after just 30 days back into the action. He came back to Lexington in the support of MacArthur's landings. What happened in your second flight in the combat zone? And can you take us through your next experience in the Philippines? Well, that was one tour I shouldn't have asked for. Um, as I might comment, as was mentioned on here, hometown had, I was leading the aviation there for four months, but while the hometown had its deal, all the pretty girls would get a hug and a kiss, and the not so pretty ones would get an autograph. Well, <laughs> well, I. I always kiddingly, uh, I have my son and daughter-in-law sitting up here in the second row, and I always tell them they wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for what happened. But the, <laughs> but the, it's an amazing story. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the parade was going by my wife to B's place, and uh, uh, I know I said stop the driver. I don't know. I was in the mood, I guess, by that time. But uh, I told the driver to stop the car, and he thought we ran over somebody. And so, but I hopped on out, and I go up to the front porch where my wife is, and I probably uttered one of the dumbest, you know, questions. I said, I, or a comment. I said, I think I've kissed everyone else, and I think I ought to kiss you too. <laughs> and she kissed back, <laughs> and. Um, we, uh, believe me, no kidding, her mother had only, there was only a two and a half week period that uh, we started seeing each other, you know, every moment of the time and uh, I asked her to, if she'd go with me while I paid my respects to my, uh, 
wingman that uh, was uh, was killed. Um, and on that mission beyond darkness the next day over the Jap fleet, and she said she would. I had fun with her mother though because her mother. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think that you you guys know about this, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the the um, <laughs> I don't know how to say this, but I rigged up a a worksheet, and uh, I was t I had to go to Iowa from from Indiana, northern Indiana, go across Illinois and go into Iowa to to pay my respects to um, Brock Myers uh, folks and. Uh, uh, back then, you know, you had to get gas coupons, and the Chicago Tribune put something in there, and I got all the gas I needed for a long time afterwards. But uh, the thing is, I, with her mother, I had rigged up this deal to get, uh, have her sign a release from the Mann Act for taking her daughter across state lines. <laughs> Those of you, well, you, some of you guys are too young to know about the Man Act. I don't know, but anyway, I was joking, and she knew I was kidding too. But, I, <laughs> but anyway, we married, and uh, I told her I was going back out again. And sure enough, uh, a friendly admiral, uh, after a few little events, but they had a war bond tour and some other stuff, and I didn't want to talk to a bunch of draft dodgers, so. I talked my way back out. They called, they got me, they sent me out. I got to Pearl Harbor, and uh, they assigned me back to the Lexington to join a squadron that had relieved us You know, a few months before that. I hitchhiked all over the Pacific. I ran into guys that had been sitting in a tent for six months waiting for a destroyer ride out of there. So this is when I learned, I think, more that the color of the uniform matters not when you're in combat. The closer you are to the front line, the color of the uniform doesn't matter. I even learned to like, not mind driving or get, hitching a ride with an Air Force guy. <laughs> I'll give you another 10 seconds on that. One. That's all right. You're my guest. <laughs> but anyway, I get back to the carrier. They had just been torpedoed, or rather kamikaze Wasn't a, a serious one. And the squadron that I was to join wasn't, wasn't there, uh, wasn't being relieved. And so the skipper of the, of the uh, carrier assigned me to the relieving carrier, uh, relieving squadron, come over from the Enterprise, join them. But to show you when your time's up, your time's up, and I don't care what you say, there's a lot of luck play on it. Because I joined the squadron on my very first hop, or second hop, the morning hop we had on December 14th of 44. Um, uh, morning hop was nothing. We had a combat air patrol over, over Luzon, my Clarkfield area, and we burned planes on the ground, but nothing would come up in the air. And in the afternoon, I had a hop, and I, again, nothing saw in the air, but I burned a couple planes on the ground, and uh, I in all fairness, I think I went too low on the second one because I burnt one, I saw one more, and I thought, well, I'll get this one too. 